broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Everyone, welcome back into the program. I hope that you're doing well and you are ready for today's show. Because today on the program, we have, of course, Ralph Bond. You can set your clock to it every Friday. We, of course, have Ralph on to talk all about science and tech trends. And, you know, that's that takes a lot of different forms of a lot of different stories. But, ladies and gentlemen, today's going to be a very fun episode because we're going to have a bit more focus. I know, focus on this program. Who would have thought? Now, with that being said, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything. Uh, our show notes, and of course, uh, the show notes that Ralph, of course, types up. He you know, makes sure to really cover everything. He, he really covers everything in there and includes links to any stories, anything like that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you know, if you're commuting, if you're driving, don't worry. Everything will be in the show notes, and those are very easy to find either at our site or at Ralph's site, where we'll have a link to that as well. So, with all that being said, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and just bring Ralph on and start the program. It's uh, it's always a lot of fun. So welcome back onto the program, Ralph Bond. He is our science and technology trends correspondent. And Ralph, welcome back onto the program. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Happy Friday. And this week, Ben and I are going to talk about four medical miracles made possible by incredible science and research. Yeah, you know, these were very, very far out there, uh, away from what we yeah. normally cover on the program. And it's, uh, you know, it's definitely going to be a lot of fun. Uh, high minded, I guess, could be, uh, you could describe some of these because a lot of them have to do with the brain. But, yes. but ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ralph, why don't you go ahead and tell the new folks out there what it is that we try to do on our segments? Yeah, Ben, if you're a listener who's new to the show, welcome. It's great to have you. What I do, I'm an aggregator of science and tech news features I find by monitoring a host of online news outlets. And I look for important stories that kind of don't capture mainstream press attention because the news cycle is so consumed with so many things like the debt ceiling and stuff like that. A lot of these great stories just don't get the attention I think they deserve. And I'm always on the lookout for news that gives a glimpse into where we're headed in robotics, medical technology, sustainable energy technology, transportation advances, space research, physics, you name it. Anything's a candidate for us to talk about. And what I do with each news item is present the essential points and in a digestible form. And we do that with what we call the show notes, which you can get at computeramerica.com. And we try to get this as easy as possible, but we also provide links and images and so forth. And what I do is I don't write these stories. I report on these stories, but there are times when I add little educational side notes. So that's why the show notes are so important to come out and check and see. And with that said, hey, again, we've got some great medical technology advancements to report this week. Yeah, and 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 uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So, ladies and gentlemen, again, computeramerica.com. And Ralph, I think with that we could just start with uh, with story number one. Yes, this is like science fiction, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> well, tiny it, it, robot it very yeah, immediately ahead. kind of brings to mind the uh, the brain slug from Futurama. If anyone remembers, you know, kind of the brain slug. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh gosh. Yes, you're right. <laughs> so the headline here is. Tiny robot injected in the skull spreads its tentacles to monitor the brain. Sounds scary, but it's really wonderful. This comes from NewScientist.com, a story by Jeremy Sue. And again, we have the link, pictures, and all the good stuff here in the show notes. So first, though, to fully appreciate the significance of this development, we need to set the stage with some background information. What we're going to talk about is an alternative for how electrodes are deployed on the surface of the brain. Electrodes that generate electrical impulses, of course, to stimulate the brain are used for a variety of purposes, including controlling abnormal brain activity or adjust for chemical imbalances within the brain that cause various conditions. 
Now, inserting electrodes is typically done by opening an invasive hole in the skull through which electrodes or leads can be inserted. So it's, a, you know, usually a fairly major surgery process. Mm -hmm. So with that said, here's the big news to offer a much less invasive alternative to opening a relatively large hole in the skull, scientists at the Federal Polytechnic School in Switzerland have developed a miniature soft robot that can be inserted through a tiny hole in the skull. You can immediately see why this is so great. Now, once inserted, the tiny bot can deploy six sensor-filled legs on the surface of the brain. And these legs can be deployed within the very limited space between the skull and the brain. That's a space of only one millimeter, a gap of only one millimeter. Get out your rulers and check that out. That's tiny. Mm -hmm. a, version, a version of this soft robot has been successfully tested in a miniature pig and could be scaled up for human testing in the future, the researchers report. And the researchers designed the robot's legs to gently expand to avoid putting too much pressure on the brain strain sensors like straining your arms or legs or whatever right strain sensors embedded in each leg convey information about when the robot legs are fully deployed this can be done without the need for additional cameras or external sensors that's an important point and by the way a side note here a strain sensor in its generic definition a strain sensor measures the relative change in length of a component or structure under stress so they've got a version of a strain sensor sensor pardon me in each of the six legs of this right. uh, device now one of the researchers noted there's actually a really large surface area on the brain that you can reach with this little bot without doing a large craniotomy and I've got a little side note here with a link about what is a craniotomy. But if you're watching us, if you're viewing our presentation today, scroll down and look at that little illustration of a skull oh, yeah. with a craniotomy. Yikes. It is a serious uh procedure and again we're talking I, about the, the entire time you've been doing this yeah. story ralph it's like yeah. you you've been saying you know a small hole in the skull and it's like th that's very relative <laughs> because there's there seems like yes. no hole that is too small to be in in the skull well, yes and and then and then of course you come out with the craniotomy and that is a large hole in the skull yes 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 exactly so that's again why this story is so important it's so uh, a wonderful breakthrough so the soft robot, to give you a feel for this, is two centimeters. That's 0 0.8 inches long, and its legs are primarily made from flexible silicone polymer. The legs resemble curved flower petals. And again, you need to see the image to get this. They resemble curved flower petals spiraling around the central body of the robot. And when fully extended, they cover a diameter of four centimeters, about 1.6 inches. Again, you can see how small this is. Mm -hmm. Each leg, each leg contains electrodes for monitoring brain activity, as we said before. Now, according to the research team, the legs could be lengthened to eight or 10 centimeters. That's three to four inches in future prototypes without having to increase the size of the hole cut in the skull. How about that? The robot was tested on a plastic and hydrogel model of the brain initially, but researchers also showed how they could deploy a straight version of the soft robotic leg. So let's be honest and clear. They're talking about not the full robot, but one of its tentacles or petals or arms, right. if you will, into the brain of a, of, of, of a pig about, well, this thing was about 15 millimeters long, about 0 0.6 inches long into the brain of a mini pig. In a demonstration inside the live animal, the soft robots electrodes recorded brain activity patterns as the researchers electrically stimulated the mini pig's snout. <laughs> Poor little <laughs> mini pig. <laughs> okay, all of this is said. Here's the key takeaway. And by the way, even before I give the concluding takeaway, this story is a good example, folks, of the trends part of what I do. Remember, you know, science and technology trends correspond. If that's my thing. This isn't ready to come to market. This isn't ready for full deployment. This is glimmer of hope, early research. Okay. So keep that mm -hmm. in mind. But here's the key takeaway with that said, if this tiny new robot proves safe and effective in humans, 
it could eventually help monitor and even treat patients who experience epileptic seizures or other neurological disorders. How about that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, and, and it really, um, you know, kind of brings to mind, uh, not just Octopus, but, but uh, Neuralink, which is, of course, Elon Musk's uh, mm. uh, system where, you know, he's he's been testing on uh, pigs as well. I don't know what it is about the pig and the human brain, but they're so similar uh, yeah. for testing purposes. But, you know, uh, I'm sure that this uh, type of technology offers the same problem promises that Neuralink has been going for, which is, you know, helping those that are, you know, maybe locked inside their bodies, maybe those who mm -hmm. don't have complete mm -hmm. function of, of, of limbs mm -hmm. and stuff and or just need mm -hmm. constant monitoring for seizures, like you said. Right, uh, right. There, there's a lot of, I guess, medical conditions, Ralph, that, you know, you can't really solve without physically getting in there and you know this super non-invasive stuff is uh way more preferable than some of the science fiction movies of yesteryear that had them you know just yes. like the top half of their skull removed you know <laughs> i.e frankenstein so yes, the, yes. very cool though and, and and very uh uh i actually looked up the scientists while you were doing the article and you know he's uh it, it's kind of fun to see that his research for the past 10 years was in like um you know not uh non-reactive uh, adhesives for the human body and then you move it into mm -hmm. uh, you know flexible robotic appendages that could sense things and you know this is like 10 years of his career has built up to this moment and it's been fun to kind of see his uh you know his pathway so very very cool story good, though mm -hmm. and ben that's a good comment because there's so much behind every one of these stories than what we're going to be able to share today. So friends, again, the show notes have the links. If you want to dig deeper and explore mm -hmm. and learn more, please come out to computeramerica.com. Get those show notes. Always more to learn, and you don't even need a robotic squid to help you. So with that being <laughs> said, story number one, story number two, and this is another really cool one because obviously... Um, I think most people at this point and know someone who's been affected by cancer and there are many, many different types of cancer, but, uh, yeah. some of the most difficult ones to treat nowadays are of course ones, you know, that deal with the brain. It's, yes. um, you know, uh, when it comes to cancer, you, you, you could get in there, you know, uh, and they do all the time. They take masses out and stuff like that, but yeah. to actually treat the entire body to treat the entire system, uh, we've had a really big problem, you know, kind of breaking that barrier between the blood yeah. and the brain and stuff like that. But right. Ralph's going to get more into that with story number two and uh, a, a, actually a huge breakthrough. Yeah, this is quite something. The headline here is chemotherapy drug or drugs, plural, can reach the brain in humans for the first time. What? Wow. This got, I uh, got this from Northwestern University's uh, online news outlet called Northwestern Now, and it's a story by Marla Paul. And in the show notes, if you're watching us, you can see the one of the researchers holding up this device. But let's get into this a little mm -hmm. bit uh, of background first. So a major impediment to treating the deadly brain cancer glioblastoma has been that the most potent chemotherapy drugs can't permeate the blood brain barrier to reach an aggressive brain tumor. And this is when I stopped and I said, well, wait a minute, you know, they're assuming I'm a medical person who knows what this is. So what is the blood brain barrier? The blood brain barrier is a microscopic structure that blocks the vast majority of drugs injected into the circulatory system from reaching the brain. The blood brain barrier is a crucial Immuno immunological feature, mm -hmm. I hope I'm saying that right, of the human central nervous system. So it's a very important uh, job composed of many types of cells. The blood ba brain barrier is both a structural and functional roadblock to microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, various parasites, you name it, that may be circulating in the bloodstream. That's its job. But unfortunately, it does its job so well, it keeps chemotherapy drugs from getting to the brain. And mm -hmm. I've got a source for this information in the show notes, by the way. So patients with brain cancer cannot be treated with most drugs that are otherwise effective for cancer elsewhere in the body, as these do not cross the blood brain barrier. Okay. And so there's, yeah. yeah. And, and, and just, uh, you know, another side that 
it, it kind of works both ways. You know, you can't really get mm-hmm. anything out from the brain through that barrier and back mm-hmm. into the body. So it's not like you have this complete circular loop like you do in, in a lot of the right. body. So like if you just right. injected it straight into the brain, you know, whatever chemotherapy drugs that you inject in there, they're going to stay in there. And that's not, you know, to kind of wash them out and wash them away in your body to kind of process and break it down. Yeah. You know, you can't just say, oh, we'll just take a needle and get through the blood, bar- <laughs> the blood brain barrier. Uh, not so simple. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very interesting additional point you just raised. That's, that's good. Mm-hmm. So here's the drum roll and the news. But now, ta-da, Northwestern University scientists report results of the first inhuman clinical trial in which they used a novel skull implantable ultrasound, keep that in mind, skull implantable ultrasound device to open the blood-brain barrier and repeatedly permeate large critical regions of the human brain to deliver intravenously injected chemotherapy drugs. You uh, let that sink in. That's the big drum roll, mm-hmm. the big, uh, the big deal here. This is the first study to successfully quantify the effect of ultrasound based blood brain barrier opening to facilitate the deployment of chemotherapy drugs in the human brain opening the blood brain barrier using the new skull implantable ultrasound device triggered by a sonication process led to an approximately four to six fold increase in drug concentrations in the human brain. That's crazy. Results of this research. Isn't that something? I mean, wow, four to six fold increase in drug concentrations. This is great. Now, in the show notes, I have a little side note. What is sonication? Because, again, when I read these articles, like everybody else, I'm sure, <laughs> listening or, or or watching us today, you go, yeah, okay. You know, they're, so- they're sonication isn't an, is. yeah, yeah, sonication isn't exactly an everyday word, so. Yeah, right. And they kind of assume you know this. So what I my, my value add to the show notes, <laughs> what I had is doing these little uh, side note research deals. So, okay, what is sonication? Sonication is the act of applying sound energy to agitate particles in a sample for various purposes, such as the extraction of multiple compounds from plants, microalgae, and seaweeds. Ultrasonic frequencies are usually used, leading to the process also being known as ultrasonication. And I've got a link in here. You can go read more about it. So it's a generalized um, technology or, or th- that's used for a variety of purposes. What the researchers are doing here is saying, hey, we can use ultrasonication uh, rather and ultrasound to do another kind of function. Great example of leveraging mm-hmm. an existing technology. So scientists observed this increase of four to six fold uh, increase in drug concentrations in the human brain by experimenting with two different powerful chemotherapy drugs. To date, these drugs have not been used to treat patients with brain cancer because, no surprise, they couldn't cross the blood brain barrier in normal circumstances. And here's another part of this, Ben, that I just love. I mean, oh, so far, this is like, oh my gosh, this is so great. It gets better. The four minute procedure to open the blood brain barrier is performed with the patient awake Mm -hmm. and patients go home after just a few hours they can go home the results show the treatment is safe and well tolerated with some patients getting up to six cycles of treatment six waves or six sessions okay in addition this is the first study to describe how quickly the blood brain barrier closes after this sonication process most of the blood brain barrier restoration happens in the first 30 to 60 minutes after sonication the scientists discovered well here we go here's the key kind of bottom line takeaway from this the findings will allow optimization of the sequence of drug delivery and ultrasound activation to maximize the drug penetration into the human brain, the researcher said. Wow. Amen. God be praised. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's really amazing that they decided to use uh, you know sonication and you know whatever damage it does, it it heals so so quickly. It's right. um, it, it, it's really amazing. And then on top of that, um, I had another point that just completely flew out of my mind. I I, I might have sonication <laughs> myself, but but it 
I'm sure it had to do with the, oh, yeah, uh, the fact that patients are able to go home after, you know, receiving, yes. you know, kind of a, a, a brain surgery, essentially. Well, not essentially, it is um, brain surgery. And then they get to go home that afternoon. Ralph, it, it's really amazing, but also kind of goes to the fact that, you know, not a lot of pain receptors inside your brain, uh, not a lot of nerve ends inside your brain. Like, obviously, the nerves go elsewhere into the body. But, you know, uh, Ralph, it, it like people are always surprised when they, uh, oh, what was that one brain surgery they did a while ago where they mm. had a violinist who, you know, she really wanted to make sure, you know, she, oh. she had like a brain tumor. They needed to take it out. Yeah. She wanted to make sure that she could still play the violin, you know, because that was her yeah. trained profession. That was her passion. Right. They had her stay awake play the violin while she was getting brain surgery and oh they gosh. actually performed the the surgery while she was playing music and if and she ever stopped or if she you know kind of messed up in any way they knew okay let's not touch that part of the brain let's keep going in a little bit of a different way so wow. um you can really do you know the the brain is a crazy thing and uh, yeah. but also this whole story on its own right to be able to you know better treat it that's a that's a huge breakthrough Oh, it is. It's a big one, a really big one. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. And hey, a little bit of uh, maybe for your next uh, Scrabble competition, Sonication. <laughs> there you go. You're, you're welcome, everyone. So does anyone even play Scrabble anymore? I'm sure they do. Uh, words with friends. That, that, that's it. So now story number two, story number three. And the picture looks a little grotesque, but it also it, it's like straddling the line between grotesque and like futuristic, like Star Trek uh, yes. style imagery. But yeah, that's that's essentially what they're promising. You know, remember Star Trek? They had like the, you know, the the medical technology that was just like, yes. you know, light beams and stuff like that. And yes. uh, all that kind of thing. But in real life, it's going to work a little bit different, I'm sure, but it's still promising amazing results. Yes. Yeah, story number three. And we, we, the whole field of trying to accelerate uh, the healing of wounds and or, as you know, Ben, from our past shows, things like special adhesives to, to suture uh, wounds without having to use traditional sutures. Uh, staples or thread or whatever. This is a field that's really active in science, medical technology research. So story number three kind of fits in this category. The headline here is scientists use electricity to make wounds heal three times faster. Wow. Uh, this is from sciencealert.com, a story by David Neald. And the picture is interesting. It is a graphic. It's not a photograph. It's kind of a graphical image. So keep that in mind, but it's to try to show the proof of concept. So here's the story. Scientists have developed a specially engineered biochip that uses electricity to heal wounds up to three times faster than normal. Now, there are some reality qualifiers you're going to learn about here in a moment. A little background. It's well known that electric fields can guide the movement of skin cells, nudging them towards the site of an injury, for instance. In fact, and this is interesting, in fact, the human body generates an electric field that does this naturally. Ha! Huh. So hmm. the researchers from the University of Freiburg in Germany set out to amplify this effect. So I love this part about in our own bodies that we create or we generate an electric field that that tries to nudge the cells together for healing of wounds anyway. So the researchers, the basic thing is the, these researchers said, Hey, can we amplify this? Can we speed it up? Mm -hmm. That's what there's, this is what this is about. So while it might not be used to quickly heal severe injuries, so reality check folks, we're not talking about someone who has a terrible, you know, laceration or something, but it could radically reduce the time it takes for small tears and minor lacerations to recover. For people with chronic wounds that take a long time to heal, such as an elderly patients or those with diabetes or people with poor blood circulation, recovering quickly from frequent small open cuts could be a literal lifesaver. So this is hmm. you know, very important, right? Well, it's established electricity can assist in healing, as said before, the impact of an electric field's strength and direction on the process has never been well established until now so the researchers developed a bioelectro oh, pardon me the researchers developed a bioelectric electronic rather platform and used it to grow artificial skin made up of cells called 
keratinocytes. I can never say this Ker- word. Keratinocytes. Keratinocytes. Thank you. There keratinocytes you thank you sir yeah which are the most common skin cell type and crucial for the healing process they also compared the application of electric fields on one side of the wound with alternating fields on both sides of the wound both healthy and i'm gonna have you say it ben keratinocytes or yeah and keratinocytes keratins. and keratinocytes designed to resemble those thank you sir designed to resemble so we're talking about the artificially created skin cells Mm -hmm. and the natural skin cells uh designed to resemble those in people with diabetes migrated up to three times faster than skin cells without any electrical interference now the team discovered that an electrical push from just one side of the wound proved most effective in repairing the artificial skin in the quickest time so again they found out, oh, really, you know, activating one side of the wound was more successful. And fortunately, none of the cells were damaged by the electrical fields tested. Huh. The next stage is testing how all this works on actual wounds in living humans rather than skin cells grown in the lab. This is another example, Ben, of the trends. This is early research. That's what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Developing practical applications to make this practical will rely on translating the cheap, readily available used materials in the experiment to real world situations. So once again, we're talking about an early glimmer of hope and (laughs) early research. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and 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 I'm I'm sure that the paper is much more detailed, and I'm curious oh, about gosh, like yes. how, how much electricity are they talking about? How big right. are these fields? Um, you know, kind of how close do they have to be? Because you know, part of right. me, Ralph, is like we already have uh, think like pacemakers that you know go inside the body, right. and they and sure. we have articles all the time about how right. either using the body's natural chemistry or using the movement can generate better electricity through kinetic motion. Blah yep. blah blah. Yep. Ralph, I'm curious what if this were to lead to let's say bandages you know maybe cast or gauze Mm. or wrap Mm. or something like that or even just Mm. you know good old band-aids uh and what if they had little wiring in them to generate these fields and not only does the band-aid kind of heal protect and cover and you know keep away bacteria and dirt and all that good stuff but also were to generate these little you know fields these little electrical fields and then also help you know kind of grow it that way and just by you know flexing the bandage or something like that you would power the field i'm wondering if it's like that level or if you really do need to like you know plug yourself into the wall to get enough electricity (laughs) i don't know well, you you make another good point. This early glimmer of hope research, you're right. What path might it follow? And it's exactly, I think the bandage idea is genius. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, there, there there's, uh, and, and, and as always, uh, long-term listeners of the show, uh, I'm sure that you're a lot like me. It's like, hey, you know, we did uh, a show, you know, 18 months ago, 12 months ago, 10 months ago, five, six, you know, whatever it may be. And all of this ties in together and, you know, starts to build upon each other. And right. uh, yeah, you know, that's how breakthrough really happens. It's little incremental kind of, uh, you know, processes so i gotta say the the image itself which shows a well obviously the scale isn't really there but i guess it's like a petri (laughs) dish with cells and this weird electrical you know kind of uh, representation uh a little misleading because if anything it should be one of these are pushing out the electrical field not both but yeah i digress either way very very (laughs) cool story in its own right picture aside very very cool so that's story (laughs) number three story number four let's go ahead and talk about um probably well not probably uh the opposite desired effect um (laughs) for a lot of people in america so story number four yes yes And, and with that tease here's the headline capsule delivers electrical current. Here comes electricity again. Capsule delivers electrical current to stomach to stimulate appetite. Most of us would like to have the opposite Mm -hmm. tablet to swallow, okay? But anyway, this comes from medgadget.com, a wonderful website, story by Con Hastings. And I've covered many of his stories in past shows. This guy's a great, great writer. Uh, And check it out. We've got also a video in this case that you can look as well if you have the show notes. To help patients with eating disorders or conditions such as a wasting condition that can occur in cancer patients, okay, 
many cancer patients we all know experiencing chemotherapy will have appetite loss problems, right? So keep that in mind. This is really very serious. Researchers at MIT, good old MIT, have developed an electroceutical capsule that is designed to be swallowed and which will deliver a small electrical current to the stomach wall. Now, little side note on wasting condition. It's a complex problem. It involves changes in the way our body uses proteins, carbohydrates, and fat. You may also burn up calories faster than usual. So mm. the wasting condition is deadly serious, literally deadly so, serious. Yeah. yeah. And 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 uh, this capsule, I got to say, so often, especially with like NASA and stuff like that, but uh, scientists love their acronyms. And I was just, you know, pulling up the video <laughs> for people who are watching the video portion. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Ralph, I... <laughs> Yeah, uh, you didn't include this in the show notes, but I did want to include it here, saying that yes. Flash uh, is the name of this capsule, and it's the <laughs> Flash stands for, ladies and gentlemen, fluid wicking capsule for active stimulation and hormone modulation. So Flash, <laughs> of course, um, of course, <laughs> that's a bit of a stretch, but please go on. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't include it because it's a mouthful, but I'm glad mm -hmm. you did. It's, it's, and again, that's another example of how the show notes can help you folks you get the link to the video you learn that little additional information so again come out to computeramerica.com get today's show notes okay so the electroceutical capsule device contains an external electrode that wraps around its exterior you really need to see the picture to get this and small grooves that draw liquid away from the electrode and help it contact the stomach wall the technology stimulates endocrine cells in the stomach lining to secrete more of a hormone called ghrelin. And that's spelled G-H-R-E-L-I-N. So this to secrete more of a hormone called ghrelin, which stimulates appetite and reduce, reduces nausea. Again, cancer patients undergoing mm. chemotherapy, we all know nausea is a terrible problem. This not only stimulates appetite, but helps to reduce nausea. Isn't that wonderful? The concept of delivering electricity to the stomach to assist with gastrointestinal issues was first trialed in patients who experienced slow gastrointestinal motility in the hope that it would enhance stomach contractions. That's what that fancy word gastrointestinal motility Motility just means getting the stomach to do its job to push matter through, right? So the MIT team, pardon me, the MIT team tested their hypothesis in animals, finding that a small electrical current in the stomach did indeed increase levels of the hormone called ghrelin. To translate this into something that had clinical potential, they have now designed the electroceutical capsule small enough to be simply swallowed avoiding the need for a surgical procedure. Very important. The MIT team designed the capsule for maximum contact with the stomach wall. Fluids in the stomach could interfere with this, so the capsule contains small grooves with hydrophilic coating that draws the fluid away from the electro. Hmm. And hydrophilic means having a tendency to mix with, dissolve in, or be wetted by water. That's the generic uh, definition. The, the opposite fact. of hydrophobic. Yeah. But there you go. Okay. <laughs> and here's a fun fact, and it's a great example of how researchers cast a very wide net to get inspiration and how often they turn to nature for their inspiration. So here's the fun fact. The concept that was behind the development of this swallowable capsule, right? Was inspired by the skin of the Australian thorny devil lizard, which contains tiny grooves that help draw water towards the lizard's mouth. <laughs> of <laughs> course. <love> it. <laughs> great stuff, great research, all medical today, but I couldn't resist. There's just so much great medical research going on. I, I felt we should dedicate one show to cover four really no, I, great and important stories. <laughs> No, I, it, it, it's really, um, I, 
I can see why you, why you focus on it because these are four great stories. And um, again, just to you know, kind of cap off the last story. So, Ralph, you think that this is going to be like you know a pill that you swallow and then it stays in there for whatever until they figure out how mm-hmm. to get it out, or is this you know uh, on the video here they're saying that, that you take one flash per day or like one pill? I, I wonder if this is like a continual like you know take it every day for increased appetite for that day. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about that either, but that's that's great. That video is fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really is. And actually, uh, a lot of the videos that you included in the show notes, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to find out more, hey, they're in the show notes on our site. They're going to be on the show notes over on Ralph's site as well. And ladies and gentlemen, there's uh, certainly a lot more to explore, not just today's show, but all of our shows. So great stories, Ralph. I, I especially like the brain ones. Uh, you know, such complex research goes into uh, stories that I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that we have made them a little bit more accessible uh, for you. And uh, yep. So Ralph, until next week, I want to thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Ralph joins us every single Friday to talk all about great stories. Uh, Today was all medical, but he also does a lot of other fields and he has a lot of great stories lined up for you. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, until next week, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye everyone.